Thanks a lot, Natasha. And thank you so much for uh, the really kind introduction and for inviting me to speak today. So um, today I want to uh, discuss with you uh, deep uh, learning approaches for solving inverse problems in imaging. Deep neural networks uh, really have influenced uh, the inverse problems community tremendously, I would say, in the last couple of years. And uh, I would like to share some of the things that we have learned from using deep learning in this context uh, today. Okay, but before I do that, uh, let me thank my research group in Cambridge. Uh, Natasha has already mentioned them, the Cambridge Image Analysis Group, uh, who are wonderful and uh, who have really tremendously contributed to the research that is underlying uh, this talk today. And uh, let me also thank all the funders uh, from uh, government, uh, from private trusts uh, and from industry who are supporting our research. Okay, so what is this talk about? So the main messages of today's talk uh, is, uh, first of all, uh, that deep learning really offers very, very interesting opportunities for inverse problems in two ways. On the one hand, neural networks are really good, have proven to be really good in modeling prior information um, by capturing information from data, by being very, very adaptive uh, to data. And this in turn has an effect on inverse problem solutions as they, this data adaptivity that deep neural networks can feature allows us to compute very, very high quality solutions. And I'll show you some examples for that. Another attractive thing about using neural networks for solving inverse problems is that once they're trained, they're computationally super efficient. They're just an explicit uh, application of linear and nonlinear uh, operations. All of this only uh, bears fruit if uh, neural network type of approaches are combined with mathematical and statistical modeling. And this is super, super true for inverse problems, which are um, usually ill-posed mathematical problems and really require rigorous mathematical treatment to compute robust solutions. So the main things are deep learning is great. It's, it uh, allows us to compute very, very um, accurate solutions to inverse problems um, to an accuracy that hasn't been seen with more traditional approaches, but we have to be careful and these types of approaches only uh, work if we combine them with what, uh, what we know about inverse problems. So what is an inverse problem? What is an inverse problem in imaging? And um, uh, I can formulate this in the most classical setting. I can formulate this within one line. I want to compute an image that I call little u from measurements y that are connected to u via a linear or nonlinear transform operator uh, that I call here capital T. This is my so-called forward operator and uh, that have been corrupted before I observe them, before I measure y, have been uh, corrupted by some measurement noise that I model here as an additive random component, little n. So a prototypical example of such an inverse problem is uh, computer tomography that I show here in these two pictures, where uh, the forward operator capital T in this case is the so-called radon or X-ray transform, which means that the measurements Y are line integrals at um, a discrete number of angles um, that are parameterized here by the uh, x-axis and uh, a certain number of y-intercepts of these lines that we are integrating over, over the image intensity that are here parameterized by the y-axis, okay? So what we are measuring are line integrals at different angles and different y-intercepts of an image intensity function, okay? Which is what we eventually want to reconstruct. 
Now, a, a very, very important thing about inverse problems is that they are usually very hard to solve. The forward problem, which is the problem, if I know the image, can I simulate these measurements? Can I compute the measurements? Is usually the easier one and is usually also a problem that is well posed. Much harder is the problem the other way around where I measure the data, which is of course the practical problem and I want to compute the source that this data has um, created. Uh, so I want to compute the image view. Um, and this ill postness comes from properties of this forward operator capital T, comes from the noise that we have in the data and in imaging also very often it comes, and this is linked to the forward operator capital T, that we usually can only afford to measure very, very uh, um, uh, much, uh, much smaller number of measurements than we have unknowns uh, in the image view, uh, so the, which is also called undersampling. We are not measuring all the angles um, uh, and all the y intercepts uh, that would correspond to the number of pixels that I have in the image. And this is usually countered with mathematical approaches. Uh, through regularization. Yeah? So I, I turn this ill post problem into a well post one through regularization. All right, this is a super quick rundown of inverse problems. Inverse problems appear in all kinds of places. Yeah? So computer tomography um, is, as I said, a very classical inverse imaging problem that, um, that uh, belongs to the broader class of medical imaging, um, where we also uh, count uh, MRI and PET, so positron emission tomography or uh, photoacoustic tomography or electron tomography or, you know, lots of different types of indirect imaging problems that correspond uh, to inverse problems in imaging. But it's much broader if you're thinking a little bit beyond this traditional definition of inverse problems. Inverse problems appear in all kinds of image-related applications. Yeah? They appear in uh, computer vision here uh, for an application for, um, uh, for, uh, for environmental sciences. They appear in image processing and image analysis. Uh, like here, I'm showing you an example from a digital art conservation project that we are running in Cambridge. They also appear in inference based on data sets of images, like uh, for the development of clinical support tools, for instance. So they appear in lots of different places. There's, so it's very, very important uh, to be able to solve them in a robust and accurate manner to serve these different types of applications. Now, how do we solve them? So, Currently, um, we can think of solving inverse problems following one or one of the two paradigms or a combination of two paradigms. One is the knowledge-driven paradigm and the other one is the data-driven paradigm. The knowledge-driven paradigm is based on mathematical modeling, mathematical analysis, statistics, um, which basically phrase the computation of you from measurements y as the solution of an equation, as the solution of a minimization problem um, that captures all the kind of modeling assumptions we have about the data, the forward operator, and uh, the type of solutions u that we want to compute, which are usually modeled by, by, um, by what, I, what I pointed out before the regularization that turns this ill post problem into a well post one that is captured here, for instance, by this uh, uh, so-called total variation regularization. Yeah? So here are just a very quick rundown of some examples. So Variational problems are an example of knowledge-driven paradigms and inverse problems, and regularization via uh, differential operators, via differential equations, um, via concepts from applied harmonic analysis, like uh, sparsity assumptions of saying that a solution can be represented in a sparse manner in some kind of basis or dictionary. Um, so these are the knowledge-driven approaches. The data-driven approaches, on the other hand, um, do not model um, the inversion uh, as the solution of an equation, a mathematical equation, but the model, the inversion model, is derived from training data, is derived from data examples 
I have of typical measurements y and typical solutions u that I want to compute from these measurements y. Yeah? Um, and uh, that is uh, starting with a very high, highly overparametrized construct um, like a deep neural network. This is mainly what we have in mind at the moment for data-driven approaches and inverse problems, just because these are the most successful ones at the moment in this regime. Um, starting with a highly overparametrized construct like a neural network, we adapt this neural network to the task we want to solve, to the inverse problem we want to solve through data, through showing it enough examples. So this is why this is data-driven, okay? And this is the right column is the one that we will mainly now talk about when we talk about deep learning approaches to inverse problems, although we will see in the different um, techniques that I will uh, uh, briefly discuss now, knowledge-driven ideas always trickling in in the really successful approaches. Huh? Okay, so let's have a look. So deep learning for inverse uh, imaging problems corresponding to the data-driven paradigm. What are the different um, strategies of attack that we could uh, pursue when uh, thinking about how to use a neural network to solve an inverse problem? And I want to uh, showcase this now to you in terms of four strategies of attack, showing you for each of those one example. Okay, so the first one is uh, the fully learned category. Yeah? So with fully learned category, uh, what I mean is that the whole process from measurements, from measurements Y to solution U is given by a neural network. Everything is modeled by the neural network. Yeah? So here I'm showing this um, for one of the uh, most prominent examples of fully learned models, one of the first fully learned models uh, called AutoMap uh, it, that has been uh, developed for uh, the inverse problem of uh, magnetic resonance tomography, where in this case, the forward operator capital T is a Fourier transform or a subsampled Fourier transform. So basically the measurements that you take are uh, frequencies in Fourier space, uh, and you want to map these frequencies in Fourier space to an image, okay, to the, to, um, uh, to the underlying uh, image that has created these frequency measurements. Um, okay, so how this is modeled in this case, as I said, is to do this full this fully with uh, a neural network, which means you, do, you on the one hand kind of need to model an inverse Fourier transform, which is a, a global operation. Hence, you need a lot, a lot, a lot of parameters in your new, on, in your layers uh, to actually represent this. Yeah, so you need to basically link every pixel in the image with every other one, which is also called fully connected layers. This, these are the grayish uh, guys here. And then uh, you model the regularization in terms of convolutional layers. Yeah? So, so these are lower uh, dimensional uh, layers uh, that are regularizing the output. Yeah? So you, get, uh, you, you need to use regularization also in this context of magnetic resonance tomography uh, because you have noise and you have undersampling. You're not measuring all the frequencies, but on, only a small subset. Okay, and the idea now is to train this network by having enough examples of typical measurements here on the left and typical uh, reconstructions that I want to compute here on the right. And this works. Yeah? So these authors have shown that this works in principle. After training this network with 50,000 brain slices, yeah? um, they apply it. And this is the result. Yeah? So what, what I'm showing here are three examples yeah, in these three uh, rows uh, of three different measurements. So the, the red um, lines and red dots uh, show you uh, the places where we have measured frequencies in Fourier space. Okay. Um, so these, these are my measurement patterns. And then based on those, I show you uh, the solution with AutoMap. And then the last column is the column which shows uh, three different types of knowledge-driven approaches to, uh, to this uh, MR uh, reconstruction problem, uh, image reconstruction problem. And here on the very left, I have the reference. This is a simulated example yeah, where I have um, uh, perfect uh, MR reconstructions as well. Okay. 
and uh, it works yeah so you, you these authors show that you can actually train a neural network to learn the inverse Fourier transform and to learn the appropriate regularization to uh, counteract the ill pulse notice that comes from noise and undersampling here and they also showed that with this you can you are able to outperform more traditional purely knowledge driven approaches as we have as we see here on the right Okay, so this is fully learned. This is one approach. Another approach is learned, what, what we also call learned post-processing. So here the idea is we do not use the network in an end-to-end -end fashion, but uh, we first uh, solve the inversion, and this is again magnetic resonance tomography, so here we are talking about inverting the Fourier transform. We are first inverting the Fourier transform in some way, um, and then we make up for all the artifacts that this very simple inversion has created uh, by using a neural network only for the regularization. Okay, so the neural network in this case maps only from image to image space, so from physical space to physical space, and not from frequency to image space, which also means that here we uh, can survive with only convolutional layers. Yeah, we don't need these, these global uh, fully, fully connected layers. Um, so very, very quickly here, it means we have, again, subsampled Fourier measurements. Um, how can we do a simple inversion? We only have uh, partial frequency measurements. So the, the, the simplest way, which is also called zero filling solution in MRI, is that you fill up all the frequencies that you don't know with zeros. And then you invert the Fourier transform. Yeah? And this is what you get. You get this uh, kind of aliasing artifact. You get lots of artifacts from doing this. Um, and then the neural network is basically um, making up for all the mess, basically, that you've created through the simple inversion uh, by uh, a neural network, yeah? employing this as a regularization procedure. And again, this works. Yeah? Um, so this is, again, an example. So here. Uh, note also the amount of images now, the amount of training data has drastically uh, reduced. So this is now trained on 1,400 images, brain slices. Um, we see here again the ground truth. So this is again simulated. We have uh, the reference image. This is the image that we get from the very simple zero filling solution from the inversion, okay, so from the very simple inversion. And this is what we get after we have run it through the trained neural network. Okay, again, it, quite impressive what um, uh, what these type of approaches can do. All right, so a third range of approaches is called learned iterative schemes. And these are schemes which are inspired by knowledge-driven uh, inversion approaches, in particular by so-called variational regularization uh, approaches. Yeah? So here, where we have seen one example of these variational principles in the left column of a couple of slides ago, where we compute uh, the solution of the inverse problem as a minimizer of a variational problem. We can think of doing this numerically by an iterative scheme, like a gradient descent scheme. And so now the idea of learned iterative reconstruction is that we uh, design a neural network architecture be inspired by how these iterations usually look like that uh, we get when we are minimizing a variation regularization approach, all right? Where we have one part of the iteration uh, making up for the regularization, yeah? Uh, which could be, again, formulated as some convolutional la layers in the neural network, and another uh, part of the iteration and uh, draws this connection between the measurements and the forward operator. So it has some uh, idea about the, the distance between my, my forward model and the measurements, how well they fit to each other. Yeah? And so this is how uh, the, the, both the inversion and the, and the model we have for uh, my inverse problem, that the, the data model I have, intertwines with uh, the learned regularization. Yeah, that uh, is given here by this by these layers that are designed as a, a finite number of iterative steps uh, following a kind of variational regularization approach. And again, this works. So 
Um, here, this is an example of computer tomography linking back uh, to uh, the, the inverse problem example that I've explained inverse problems and in imaging with. Uh, the simple inversion that corresponded to the zero filling solution in MRI before is the filtered back projection. Uh, this is um, uh, um, a variational regularization solution with the so-called total variation, a prototypical uh, knowledge-driven variational regularization approach um, um, uh, in imaging. Uh, and this is what you get with this learned iterative reconstruction approach. Now, yeah, the neural network whose architecture is designed um, with this, very, this, this iterative scheme um, uh, in mind. Carola, I got carried on with your lecture. Uh, two minutes left, sorry. Okay, thank you, Natasha. Thank you. That's, uh, uh, that's enough. Because I only have one paradigm left, which is the learning the regularizer. Okay, so here the idea is, now the learned iterative schemes are uh, network architectures that are inspired by knowledge-driven approaches like variational regularization. What I want to do now, and this is, I would say, the one that is closest to my heart, I want to use a knowledge-driven paradigm, a variational regularization approach, and embed the neural network into this variational regularization approach. Okay? Uh, and in particular, I want to deploy it as the regularization, as the term that makes the, uh, the inverse problem well posed. Okay, so I start with a variational problem like this uh, that we've seen before. I have a data discrepancy term. So I, I model my solution U as uh, my, my image U as something that should approximately fulfill in least square sense my forward model. And I complement this with a regularization term that usually encapsulates prior information about the type of solutions that I want to compute of this inverse problem. Yeah, the regularized solution that should um, attenuate all the, the noise and the artifacts that I have get from the ill postness of capital T. And in this case, we want, in the, in the learned case, we want to model this prior information that should drive this regularizer R by, by uh, an appropriate, uh, by the design of an appropriate training data set yeah? of the so-called good guys and bad guys. I want to train the regularizer to differentiate between the solutions that I want to compute from this variational, uh, 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 that I want to compute from this inverse problem and the solutions that you want to penalize, the simple inversion solutions that show all the noise and the, the, the uh, basically the unregularized solutions that show all the noise and the artifacts that are due to the properties of this forward operator and the noise and, uh, and the measurement noise. Okay, so I and this is and I train this therefore in, the, in this adversarial manner. So this is uh, we also call this the adversarial regularizer, the adversarially trained regularizer. Uh, as we train it. Uh, to be small for um, samples from the data set of the, that I call here the good guys. So very, very high quality reconstructions and uh, the bad guys, which are simple reconstructions, unregularized reconstructions, which, which are super noisy. And um, uh, I want the variational um, problem to avoid. I want the regularizer to penalize, okay? So how do I do this? Uh, this actually boils down to um, parametrizing the regularizer. Let's look here at the second bullet point. I parametrize the regularizer now as uh, something that will depend on a neural network. So that it has a neural network term that is the psi theta in it. Um, that uh, in the recent work that we have done, you can actually model as a convex neural network, as a convex term, which makes the overall nice, overall variational problem that you get out a convex model, which is, which is good, has lots of advantages. Um, and uh, uh, um, a little quadratic term that, that renders the whole regularizer a strongly convex regularizer. And then we train the neural network part of this regularizer in this adversarial manner with the good and the bad guys with using uh, a loss function so this is now uh, inspired here by this Wasserstein distance between the distribution of the bad guys, which is uh, the distribution PN, and the good guys, the distribution PR, uh, as uh, a regularizer that should be large, you're maximizing this here, a regularizer that should be large when fed with samples from the bad guys. 
and that should be small when fed with samples from the good guys. Okay, so this is this 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 uh, adversarial loss function that we are using here. Okay, and this is a proxy that we use uh, when we deploy this uh, for uh, a regular for using for using it to train the regularize psi theta here uh, that is given by this convex neural network. So here we optimize this for the parameters theta. So the overall strategy is that we create the training data of good guys and the training data of bad guys. And then we train the regularizer in this adversarial manner. And then we plug it back into the variational approach. And we solve this for new data that we get by some kind of iterative scheme. Yeah? And the nice thing, of course, about that is that this is a well-posed model that we get in the end. We are, we are, we are sticking to something that we understand. Um, I'll finish with showing you the uh, result of uh, this, this learned adversarial regularizer in the context of computer tomography, where we make uh, a super, super um, difficult computer tomography problem, which is called limited view, uh, limited view CT, where we are not uh, measuring all the angles. So this is my axis of the angles, but we are leaving out a whole wedge of, uh, of angles, 60 degree wedge of angles, where we are not measuring anything, yeah? where we're not uh, computing the line integrals. If we do this with a, with a conventional kind of approach, you exactly see um, which directions you have been missing. Yeah? Okay, and I show this now, the results for an open uh, clinic CT data set. Um, and I compare a simple unregularized reconstruction filtered back projection with total variation regularization, which is a prototypical knowledge driven variational approach uh, against the adversarial regularizer, the adversarial convex regularizer against um, uh, one instance of this learned iterative approach, okay, that, that I've also showed you before. So how does it look? On the left, we again have the nice, beautiful ground truth uh, CT slice. And on the right, you see what, the, what uh, the different inversion approaches do if you are looking at limited angle measurements. This is filtered back projection. You again see exactly where uh, the angles are missing. This is um, total variation regularization, the prototypical knowledge-driven variational approach already does quite a jump. This is what you get with the learned convex, with the learned at the serial regularizer. And this is what you get with uh, the learned iterative reconstruction approach. Yeah? And so if you compare very briefly those two, the learned iterative reconstruction and the learned regularized, the learned variational reconstruction, then you see on the one hand that in terms of um, quality measure, this is the uh, so-called PSNR, computes a distance to the ground truth. In terms of PSNR, uh, the learned and, and the higher the better. The learned iterative reconstruction is much better actually than the learned um, variational reconstruction. But you also see that you pay for this. And this is one thing, one advice of warning that with um, the with approaches like uh, the ones that are purely driven, um, that, that are mainly driven by the neural network, you sometimes end up, while the overall thing looks much better, you sometimes end up with things that are not quite right and that are, that, that, that are destroying the structures. Like if you're looking here and here, um, this is much more truthful uh, if you're actually uh, sticking to a mathematical approach. Yeah? Okay, verdict. Uh, briefly running down, fully learned models, they work but they're limited by the availability of good data. You need a lot of data. We needed 50,000 brain slices to train them. And they're limited also by, by computational uh, capabilities because we need to train huge, huge, huge networks with these fully connected layers. Learned post-processing circumvents the inversion. So it first inverts and then it uses the network to do an image to image regularization. Uh, it works, uh, gives good results. It is limited uh, in terms of generalizability, in particular in comparison with learned iterative reconstructions where the inversion and the regularization are um, intertwined in the neural network architecture. And then the learned variational models, which is the last one that I've shown you, they 
approach the problem in a slightly different way. We start with, with the variational model and you integrate the learning in the variational model, which has the uh, advantage of sticking to a mathematically rigorous inversion framework that still gives good results. Not as good as the learned iterative reconstructions um, in terms of quality measures, but uh, in terms of robustness, uh, they definitely um, uh, have advantages. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Natasha. I think I leave the takeaway messages like this uh, and stop here. Thank you so much uh, for uh, giving me this slot. Thank you. Thank you very much for extremely interesting uh, lecture. I, I forgot about time, sorry. <laughs>